Hello, everyone. Welcome in. Hi. I'm going to get started in just a few minutes here. Uh, but on behalf of Book Larder here in Seattle, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Meghna Jaradi. I'm the event manager here at Book Larder. And uh, we are so excited to uh, be here to talk about uh, Ron Goyaga's brand new book, Canela Vanilla Bake Simple. Um, I'm going to introduce both Aran and Claire Saffitz, who will be joining us um, in conversation tonight. Um, but before then, if you are listening and tuning in, let me know where you are joining us from tonight. I'm here in Seattle. Um, where are you? Hello, Chris. Chris is listening from Halifax, Nova Scotia. Welcome. A few Seattleites here in the house. Vancouver, California, Sydney, Australia, Honstead, Michigan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, um, for spending the evening or the day with us, depending on where you're listening from. We're going to get started in just a few minutes here. Um, I am continued, I continue to be impressed by um, how many people show up to our virtual events, um, despite uh, Zoom fatigue and, um, you know, continued event restrictions. So it really means a lot that, that all of you are here and joining us tonight. Um, it's my very great pleasure to, um, to introduce Aran Goyaga and Claire Saffitz. Um, before I get into their intros, I just want to let you all know that we will have signed copies of the book available here um, at booklarder.com. I will um, paste a link into the chat for anyone that's interested in purchasing a copy. You can support this author talk by um, grabbing a copy of Canelli Vanille Bake Simple from, um, from us or from your favorite independent bookstore. Um, I also wanted to let everyone know that the publication date for the book has shifted a bit just due to um, supply chain um, variables. So um, the new date for release is the 26th of October. Um, books will be available for um, pickup or um, we can ship them to you after that date. So I just, I wanna let everyone know that. Um, tonight's event's also being recorded. If you um, know anyone who you think would really enjoy the event or if you just wanna rewatch it, that will be available on our YouTube channel after the event. And you will also get a post event note from Zoom with a link to watch um, after the fact. Um, if you have any questions for either Iran or Claire, you can submit them to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's got two little uh, quote bubbles on it. Um, and that will just help us keep track of all of your questions. We'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, and Q&A will happen towards the end of the event here. Um, you're also welcome to use the chat function here on the side. There's another button for that at the bottom of your screen there um, to just share your general feedback and comments, um, to talk to other attendees. Uh, feel free to use that as you would like. Um, all right, so uh, tonight we are going to be hearing from uh, Aran Gayaga. Basque Born is a award-winning author, photographer, and professionally trained pastry chef. She is a three times James Beard finalist. Her second cookbook, uh, Canelli Vanille, Nourishing Gluten-Free Recipes for Every Meal and Mood, has been named Best of 2019 by New York Times, Food and Wine, Bon Appetit, Food 52, NBC News, Elle, and more. Her first cookbook, Small Plates and Sweet Treats, My Family's Journey to Gluten-Free Cooking, was named one of the top cookbooks of 2012 by Sarah Moulton on Good Morning America and praised by the New York Times and Goop. Um, Aran lives in Seattle. Uh, she's here in Seattle today, uh, and she lives here with her family. Um, Aran's going to be joined in conversation by Claire Saffitz, a uh, freelance recipe developer and video host. Previously, she was senior food editor at Bon Appetit, where she worked for five years in the test kitchen and hosted the series Gourmet Makes and Baking School on the Bon Appetit YouTube channel. After graduating from Harvard University, Saffet studied pastry in Paris at Equal Gregory Ferrandi and then received a master's degree in culinary history from McGill in Montreal. 
Her first cookbook, which some of you may have already, uh, Dessert Person, is published by Clarkson Potter, and she lives in, in New York City. It's my very great pleasure to welcome both Aran and Claire to the Book Larder virtual space. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and taking the time to chat with us, to chat with um, our audience members. Uh, we're so excited to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Magna. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Your bio, Claire, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Well, thank you. Yours too. Um, I like never know what to include on those. I'm just like, does anyone care about this? But um... yeah. I didn't know you went to Harvard. And then I just realized it's in the back of the book of your book. Oh. <laughs> That's amazing, uh, which I have you. here. Which oh. I've, I've told you earlier, but um, everybody that has just joined, I was carrying all day with me and it came out last year. So I, I'm well aware of it and I've looked through it. But today I kind of just took the day to do my errands and I had it with me in my car. And so anytime I was sitting in the car, I was actually like <laughs> reading through it. And I kind of wanted to know more like beyond the recipe, sort of like, you know, like your intro and like your head notes, because it's always kind of where all the little bits, you know, of like perspective live. Right. So. Right. I mean, the introduction, I think, is where authors in for a cookbook, like explain the project and and sort of set forth the structure and the, the inspiration behind the book. And um, that's one thing I love about cookbooks is that you can anyone can just open them up to a recipe and make something from them and they can enjoy it on that level and just have it be a source for recipes. Or you can really kind of dive in to the inner thoughts and workings of the author's mm -hmm. mind and um sort of think about the structure. And that's really, that's a great way to sort of enter into discussion of your new book, which is so beautiful tonight, Canal Even Me Big Simple. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have to, I have to tell the audience, like Aaron and I chatted yesterday. So we already like covered a little bit and just sort of um, our introductions to one another. Um, and I also just want to back up and say that this is a great pleasure for me. And I have been really inspired by your work for many, many years, going back to when I was like a somewhat um, lost graduate student in, um, to, in 2012. Uh, and I've really just been a follower of your work and admired on so many levels. So this is a great privilege for me. And I'm, I'm really excited to talk about the book. And I also sort of selfishly, like as a relatively new cookbook author, I'm just so curious to talk to other authors that I admire about their process and their work because I really want to know, you know. Um, so I actually wanted to start the conversation by reading you a quick little note um, that a friend sent me last week. So there's a friend who's a, an accomplished cook and home baker um, and was diagnosed not too long ago with celiac. And so this mm -hmm. is what she wrote me. She wrote, I just bought cannelli vanille and made gluten-free sourdough and I'm rather excited about it. Bread that tastes like dot, 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 bread and crunches and toasts and does bready things. I cannot overstate how amazing this is. Um, and so my guess is that you hear this not infrequently about your recipes, um, but I wanted to read it because I think it really captures this sense that your recipes give, especially, but not exclusively for people who eat gluten-free for various reasons, that there's like something really magical about them and that they unlock this sort of previously sort of un like impossible world of, of recipes that people can enjoy again. And, and I'm so struck by just flipping through the pages of the book, sort of how miraculous these recipes oh. feel. And there's like this sort of magic and, and sorcery to them. So I, I just wanted to share that because that's the feeling that I get. And I am a baker and that's my craft, but there's something that just feels like extra special about these and the kind of possibilities that they um, unlock. So I'm just, I want to start was saying that and then also directly kind of dive into what I think is really like a central recipe in the book and then I'll stop talking, um, which is the, your technique for gluten-free sourdough because I think that that is what feels really special for people that are, have not been able to enjoy bread made with wheat flour. So if you could just sort of talk about your development of that, that whole evolution of developing that technique. So um, thank you, I love that. And I, and I actually, I do get, uh, that comment a lot and I it always moves me and I feel uh, really emotional about it because sometimes uh, I don't know if this happens to you but in my ego working alone and in the inner workings of that kind of very introverted recipe developer 
you're always kind of, you get stuck in, and I think we mentioned this yesterday in our conversation, I get stuck in like the perfection of a recipe or, you know, and sometimes in that isolation, I forget like the transcendence of a recipe and that really why I'm doing this is so it reaches somebody and then they're able to use it and incorporate it into their life. And actually in the introduction, I really wanted to make that a point to that, you know, things that we have been giving, given that we kind of transform them, make them our own, and then we pass them on. And so, so having said that, in that same uh, process, I've also learned from other people. So I, you know, I, when people, oh, you're sourdough bread and, and yes, I mean, I've spent many years with this and developing this recipe one, but I have learned from other people. So like Dan Leppard, who is actually not a gluten-free baker, but he's a British, he writes for the Guardian and he's a bread baker. And, but he kind of had some, I remember, this is probably like five or six years ago, I read um, a story he did on gluten-free baking and he started talking about psyllium husk. And I was like, what is that? And so like, and then Naomi Devlin, whose sourdough starter recipe, I tried maybe five years ago. And through her, I kind of started learning about like, sort of the, how is that different from a wheat sourdough starter? And so like, I have learned from many other people as well. And so like for me to take that information and transfer it or, or process it through my kind of taste or, or style or whatever it is that you do, like one person does and pass it on. I think like that's really, um, you know, I don't want to forget that. Like, I don't want to have that to be a blind spot that I've actually not in a bubble. Like I've learned from so many people, but yeah. having said that, um, so this sourdough starter, sourdough bull thing started with, like I said, it was a river, sorry, I'm like so nervous, a river <laughs> cottage, <laughs> you know the river cottage cooking school in, in the UK? Yes. And they have a series of books and one of them was gluten free and it was Naomi Devlin and it, I, don't, I don't know if she's logged in because she's in the UK, but um, it was through her book that I was like, oh wow, like somebody here who's making you know, sourdough starter out of brown rice flour. And so then I kind of started working with her recipe and developing that was for the starter. And then I tried her recipes for the bread and then I wanted to make them into a bowl. And so then I had to kind of tap into, essentially it's the same principles as making a wheat bowl. I mean, there's clearly some basic differences, but just that you need to incorporate something that's going to give it some structure and elasticity, but like the way you bake it, how you get it crusty, you know, baking something in a Dutch oven, a bread in a Dutch oven versus putting it in a sheet pan without steam, like the outcome is going to be different. Um, so just like really kind of merging the two ideas and just practicing a lot. Like I, my, my son actually, every time he eats it, not every time, but oftentimes he's like, mom, how long have you had this starter? And I, you know, and I try to think back about like when they were little and kind of I was experimenting with all this stuff and just the different iterations. And I was actually looking through my phone uh, recently and I was like finding old versions of that bread. Um, and one of them was like in a loaf pan. And so it's like different kind of ways. And it goes back to recipe testing. It's like, when do you start stop testing something? Right. Um, so you know, that, that was kind of how it all, but now I feel like even since, you know, my, that recipe came out two years ago, but in those, in these last two years that I've, uh, that it's have gone by since that came out, um, my last book, just by travel, helping troubleshoot people, like people's different, and this probably happens to you too, when people say, okay, well, this is what happened to my bread. And then I started asking them questions. Okay, what kind of psyllium did you use? Is your oven a gas oven, an electric oven? And all these little things that they say. And then, and then I'm like, oh, okay. Then I start incorporating that into my recipe. And so like in my troubleshooting steps. And so like, I feel like it's always a, a give and take. And um, so a, lot, a little bit like my readers are a little bit part of my recipe tester audience. You know, they're my audience and also my recipe testers. And I learned so much from the feedback. So I, and especially with gluten for baking and bread baking, that is kind of like such a, uh, there's not a lot of resources out there. Um, 
And I, I find that it's just been kind of a, I take from here, I learn from some people, other people learn from me, but I also learn from them. So it's kind of been like very, uh, what's the word, reciprocity, like the process. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a really important sort of point to make and bring up, which is that I think this is true for all recipes, but especially a recipe like a bread recipe or sourdough, where it's really a, it's really a technique and there's sort of principles that are guiding it and that are giving it, giving it form, but, um, but they're, they're never really, they're never really done. And it's always, it's a sort of a living thing and they're mm -hmm. always changing and you're always making little tweaks to it and discovering something new about it. So it's like, it might be in a book inscribed somewhere, but it is always changing and developing. And um, that's one of the great things about having like your platforms that you can share with people when you've made a new discovery or you're doing something a little bit different and, and to be able to incorporate feedback from readers and from home bakers is so great. And is, you also said something earlier about like, you know, when you're in the sort of very cloistered process of, of developing where you're alone and it's solitary, it's, it's something entirely different than when your recipe goes out into the world and is being made with people. And it's sort of a wonderful process of um, like a feedback loop, you know, in, in for, for recipe developing. So I think that's a, a great sort of thing to recognize about the, the recipe development process is it's sort of yeah. never, it's never really done. Um, and um, maybe you will um, touching upon this, like openness, like how, which I don't think is an issue nowadays. Everybody's really open with the recipes because we know that when we share, we get things back, right? But I grew up, and you might recognize this having learned in France. Um, I grew up in a very, it's a different time. And my grandparents, you know, were pastry chefs and my uncles and my mom were front of the house. And so it was very, I remember it was like very, um, how would you say it? Like a very secretive environment. Uh -huh. <laughs> like you would never tell somebody. Like you, I remember when I started my blog, like in 2008, and one of my cousins who now works in the pastry shop was, afraid that I was going to share a recipe for my family in the blog and I was just like wow I never understood that kind of mentality of like well if you never open up you know you will never receive any feedback or any you will never have any room for improvement because you're kind of in a chamber so I think like that applies to us too it's like once the like you're saying the recipe goes out into the world you know often most of the time it just gets better because mm people are working on it. It's like you right. multiply, you know, like this, all these people, anyhow, I'm going. <laughs> right. No, yeah. I, I totally. And I think I am like a little bit suspicious of secret recipes, you know, because mostly I just think, I mean, in the case of your family, it feels like there was this strong sense of those recipes being proprietary and something mm -hmm. that, that belonged in the family. Um, but when I, when I hear about like secret recipes from restaurants or something I'm I usually am suspicious and I I generally my feeling is that there's something in the recipe that they don't want people to know is in there and that's why they won't share it <laughs> so that's my like own, MSD like, or something. right yeah like my own conspiracy theory about like why certain recipes are secret but I agree like I think that and this is something we touched on yesterday and sorry for people that are tuning in because we had a great conversation yesterday um but that I feel like writing a book is really um, one way to look at it is that it's like an act of generosity because you are creating this thing, especially a baking book, because baking recipes are like by definition meant to be shared. You know, you're not like baking very rarely are like you baking for one. Um, and so it's an act of generosity. You are giving people recipes, which are, you know, tools for sort of sociability and, um, and kind of, you know, sharing in this, in this really joyful way. So I, I, I love that attitude about it. And, um, you know, I don't think that like sharing a recipe takes away from the sort of abilities that people recognize that, that you have. Um, so I think that's wonderful. And one thing I'm sort of wondering about the recipes, especially for this book is, and because I'm so curious about your creative process. One question is like, do you, do you, ha has it been your experience that by having the constraints of, of gluten-free baking and, and because so many of the recipes in the book also are, are, are vegan or can be made vegan, which is kind of blows my mind. Like, does, do you feel like that encourages your creativity? Cause sometimes I feel like I actually work better and I'm better, a better problem solver when I have more rules or like fewer possibilities. Sometimes I don't like too many options. So is that, has that been your experience? Or is it, yeah. Um, well, the, I would say, um, I get this question about vegan a lot. 
And I don't want to uh, sell the wrong story or like a fake story. I'm not vegan. Right. Um, and I think a third of the recipes are vegan as written. A third can be easily made vegan. And then a third are not, you know, they're like pastry cream and things like that, that you can't just replace the eggs. Right. It's never um, going to be vegan. <laughs> but I am very um, motivated by that idea of, of finding uh, kind of the new frontier of plant-based plant -based baking. And so I'm not dogmatic about anything, but it's, it's just like one more challenge, like you say, and I really love uh, presenting that alternative. And some people are for lifestyle choices. Some people are doing it because, you know, intolerances, there's an array. Um, and I, me personally, I don't eat gluten or dairy uh, because it, it's not, you know, I have autoimmune stuff and it kind of creates inflammation, my son as well. Um, so it's not like, oh, those are evil. I, I would always, I never want to present anything I do as like an elimination. I mean, clearly I'm an eliminating because I can't have those things, but it's never, it never comes from the mindset of like um, restriction for me. Like, I don't ever want it to feel like that, even though ultimately it is right. But I don't want ever, anybody to ever feel like they're going without or um, so. I think I like restrictions and I think I, I love the challenge of always kind of coming up with things. And I would never, I mean, I think there is a mention of using like a vegan cheese. Maybe I think I, in a head note, I say uh, for a biscuit, for the cheddar biscuits that you could use uh, like a vegan cheese. But I personally, I say, they're, it's not as good, so then just don't, you know, just don't use it because right. I'm not kind of like a substitution. Like I love to create, let's say, cashew cream and use that like as a cream or like I have other, there's like a cashew and whipped um, cream that kind of acts like a mascarpone, like a whipped mascarpone um, and it tastes delicious. And so like that, but I would never just want to like, again, you know, like substitute things. Um, although, you know, I say that, but then I do reference using dairy-free butter with oftentimes when you buy it in the store, you know, it's not, depending on what you're buying, it can have kind of fillers and sort of stabilizers and lecithins and things like that, that, you know, um, so it's, it's kind of tricky. Like I, I, I try not to be too dogmatic about anything. Um, and I, but I'm very mindful of like, uh, making something wholesome without just like compromising things. So sugar is another big thing that I get asked a lot about. And to me, sugar, yes, it's a sweetener. And I know a lot of people don't eat sugar, but you know, we're dealing with like baking, which is like a treat. Like it's, it's not something that you should be eating at all times. Mm -hmm. And sugar is not just a sweetener. Like it adds, you know, as you know, it's a state, you know, it's a emulsifier, it's a stabilizer, like making jam without sugar. It's like, you can't really preserve things. Like right. it has a purpose beyond just a sweetener. So you can't just say, oh, I'm gonna take that and use honey all the time or maple syrup all the time because you will not get the same texture. So for me, I go from a place of like, this is what like a cookie should be, you know? Yeah. And that's, yeah. I'm always kind of tweaking, tweaking like, you know, what's the ratio of granulated white sugar with brown sugar? And I'm sure you do this. We all do that, especially with cookies. It's like, until I have the, the spread that I want, uh, the crunch that I want. And so I remember when I, um, you know, I studied business and economics in university. And so my brother, when I told my parents that I was going to go to culinary school, my, my brother said, um, you have good taste. So whatever you do, you will do it well. And I always kept that, like, he knew what it meant. Like he knew that I had a vision for whatever I was doing. And at the time I wasn't gluten free, but um, that I kind of was always like looking for something that was like really minimal. And it's taken me a long time to get there, but like, um, and we talked about this yesterday too, what its simplicity is. So like really simplifying things, but really being uh, mindful of like the texture that we want um, sensorially too. Like when you're eating something like a crunch, it's not only, you know, it's not only in your taste buds, like it's also your hearing, like it's so many things, right? When you're biting into something. Um, 
turning that I'm, I'm yeah. just going around in circles. No, but I, no, I, I just, there were like three things in there. And I was like, <laughs> that is the next thing I want to talk about. Um, so I'll have to pick, but, but I think you identify what in, in a very clear way, what I think really sets your, what, what makes me see your work very differently than the way I see so much other gluten-free baking or recipe development around sort of um, certain types of diets because there nothing ever feels like it is, um, it, it feels very abundant. It feels very, um, as you say, like sort of sensual, like it appeals to the senses. It, it, to me, there is nothing lacking in what I see. I don't, I, I wouldn't eat or look look at any of your recipes in a way that felt like, oh, I feel like that's gluten-free, which, you know, okay. is sort of an, a shorthand for saying like, not as good in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, that kind of kills me too. And that when you said, like, when you see special diets, it's like, I'm always put in that category. Like my books are always in like the special diet category, even when like right. the words and stuff. And it just kind of always, I feel like I'm always in this very uncategorizable category. Mm. And so I, that kills me. <laughs> I see, but I see your book as something very different because I see it as like, this is a baking book that is also, that sort of happens to be gluten-free or that is gluten-free. Mm -hmm. But I, I think about it, like the recipes to me look like if you didn't know that it was gluten-free and you were just flipping through the pictures, I don't think that you would ever identify that about it. And so to me, there is, it is not about restriction. It is about the opposite it is about abundance and, um, and, you know, enjoyment and, this sort of like everything has just the right amount of, of everything, you know? So, um, well, so I try I, to also like, if I can have, I mean, there's plenty of dairy free butter listed in this book. So I don't want to like pretend it, there isn't, but like, if I can substitute that fat, it's another kind of fat and I, and people can use butter, but like in my life, like instead of pulling for the vegan sticks, if I can use, you know, tahini, almond butter, coconut oil, olive oil, whatever other grapeseed oil, which is probably not my favorite, but like whatever it is that, that I'm not trying to just like do a quick substitution. And that's why I don't actually use blends. Like, I mean, I, I see the point of like one-to-one, -one, those kinds of blends. And I actually offer, I have like a little mix, um, that I mentioned in the book, if people want to just have something in the cupboard that they can kind of use quickly, but it's not, I'm always trying to see like, if I can like a banana bread recipe, if it functions well doing half, let's say brown rice flour and half almond flour, then why am I going to use like a blend that has a bunch of starch in it? That's not adding any flavor. So sometimes you do need starch and it's kind of like, you know, not the most flavorful thing, but it does provide a textural element or a binding element, which is necessary. But other times when you don't really need that for like a quick bread or a cookie or something, then, then don't use it. So I'm right. always kind of thinking like in those terms of like, what is, so for example, if I'm making a sourdough bowl, I want the crumb to be open and airy, right? But if I'm making like a rye, rye style, like Nordic bread, that I don't need the crumb to be really open and it can be really dense, then why not go for like super whole grain, like really rich, like buckwheat or something like that. Mm -hmm. But like, then if I take that kind of ratio of whole grain to starch and put it in the bowl, it's never going to be the same bowl, like the same airiness. So it's like, I'm always trying to kind of identify what is the, what is the, the, the qualities of what I'm looking for? Um, right anyway. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, I really, I'm really glad that that's, that you're discussing this because that sort of like backs into what I wanted my next question to be, which is sort of about the idea of simple. Cause the, the headline, I mean, this is, can I even eat big simple? Mm -hmm. Um, and that I think sort of answers that question of like, what is, I think there's so many definitions of simple and there isn't one. And it is sort of a, an idea that's like fetishized in the recipe development world. It's like simple, this simple, that it, it's a, it's sort of a selling point, but it also, I think very often like lacks meaning. Um, so I'm just sort of wondering, and you, you, you talk a little bit about an introduction. You say in my mind, simple doesn't always mean quick or short recipes. Sometimes simplicity requires understanding why we do what we do, which I think is sort of what you were getting at. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in what you were, you were just saying. So I'm just sort of wondering if you can expand on a little bit on 
what simplicity means in this book and 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 your and is it it really sounds like it's more about your approach and it doesn't mean that you can't have a recipe that has you know a couple of different components um it doesn't always as you said like it's not just about you know 30 minute cakes or whatever it, it's really an approach so if you could sort of talk a little bit yeah. about that. I actually was um when I was looking for your book today and you have kind of the different categories of difficulty <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. all the recipes and I was thinking about that and but I think like, yes, there's always kind of a, a deeper understanding to, you know, if you're going to reach for a laminated dough, you have to have a reach, richer, deeper, maybe historical understanding, not historical in time, but like your own kind of experience with it um, to be able to understand the process. So, so clearly I can't explain every single detail of a recipe, but I, I think for me, it's like, I do the work for me. It's like, I am, when I'm recipe testing, I really do the work so that the, when you are making this recipe, it works as written. And that I explain to you, like, even in the recipe itself, like, it's not just time, but what are you looking for? Like, what are, what, like the little things of like, this is what the dough should look like in mm -hmm. troubleshooting and all these little things. And so for me, it's like, what I said, it's like, if I have, which I have actually learned so much from my initial first book that came out in 2012, because I was telling you yesterday, like I had recipes. My goal was to like really make, okay, I'm going to go all gluten-free. So if I'm going to have a cake, I'm going to have like five flowers in it to kind of like buckwheat and teff and like all my flour, like everything mixed in there. But it was such small amounts of each that really it wasn't making a huge difference in the outcome right? And the texture of the cake or whatnot. And I could have really simplified. I could have made it so much easier for the reader. And so like, that is like, I think to me, it's an indulgence. And so now, and clearly with my previous book and then with this one, my goal was to like, really, how far can I take it down? How far can I eliminate or shorten the list of ingredients um, without compromising what I see that the ideal texture, flavor, profile to be. And so it's like in that process of uh, distilling the recipe, I guess, or like really going through a lot of recipe testing, which is what we do, like, right. right. Um, so, you know, can I, let's say I have a cake, I had like, there's a cake uh, or there, a cookie, sorry. And I meant to only use like maple syrup as a sweetener. But then I wasn't really, because I just wanted like one sweetener, but then I wasn't really getting the texture that I wanted. And it was a cookie and I needed a little crunch. So then I was like, okay, well, I need to introduce like a coconut sugar or like a cane sugar. Something needs to be in there to provide that. And so like in that case, for me, rather than just making a short list of five ingredients, it's more important that ultimately what you're making has certain characteristics. And so that it's really about like, where you compromise and don't compromise. Right. It's and like, it's like distilling the kind of essence of the recipe and then thinking like what, and what, so what does the recipe need to be that, you know, and then, yeah. which I really identify with. And I think is, is really hard. And it is just sort of your mentioning of your, of your first book and that kind of approach, like that is something I identify in like my own career too. It's like, you kind of want to you feel like you have something to prove and you want to sort of show what you're capable of. And, um, and I think it's a real sign of, um, of, a of the evolution of a recipe developer that you sort of like, like the, you sort of let the recipe dictate mm -hmm. with the decisions, you know? Um, and I think having more of a, when you embark on a first project to, let's say, you know, when you're in the magazine or like my first book, you really don't have, you don't have the experience of having to communicate with your audience yet because you're still in the very early process of like creating something. Mm -hmm. And then it's when it goes out, then you realize where you didn't have, I always call it restraint. Like I, mm -hmm. I didn't have enough restraint or something. Like it really is about like, you're thinking about them and how they're going to use it and how you're trying to minimize it without compromising anything. So when they're at home, they're successful. And so right. like, it's always like, I think for me, I didn't have my audience, the people right. at home in mind, cause I didn't have enough experience. And right. then when the feedback started coming and, and then you learn. And so I feel like now I am so grateful. My recipe testers, I had like 31 recipe testers in this book, all 
altruistic. Everybody just wanted to help me out. Mm -hmm. um, so I need to really thank them. And, um, you know, just all the people who give me feedback, um, who baked from the previous book. And so I'm, I'm hoping the same from this one. And right. I hope they're kind. It's like, I'm so afraid. You know how it is like when a recipe. Oh, it's very nerve wracking. Oh, it's good. I hope it works in somebody else's kitchen. Totally. Uh, yeah, I had that experience when Dessert Person came out. It was like to see anything turn out in anyone's kitchen. I was like amazed, you know, um, it's, it's thrilling, but nerve wracking. Um, so I totally get it. I think, I mean, that sort of speaks to a little bit of your creative process. And we sort of touched on this, but I'm so, I, I sort of get this very specific feeling when I look at your recipes, which is the same feeling that I aspire to with my own recipes, which is just this sort of sense of delight and also interest when I especially look at like a lot of the flavor combinations that that I see in here and that I've see, seen, you know, through, throughout your career and your recipes. Um, in this book, thank you, I'll show everyone the cover again, just in case, mm -hmm. or just cover. Um, but just to give a couple examples, there's plum and toasted miso upside down cake. There's quince chamomile oat bars, and there's something that feels like very romantic and very evocative about them. Um, and so- Sometimes I'm too romantic. Oh, really? I, that's oh. one of the aspects of my work that I try to restrain. Oh, interesting. I, I become really like whimsical sometimes in my head, which is not a very practical. I sort of navigate between this like romanticized idea of nature and things and mm -hmm. the seasons and all that with a mm -hmm. pragmatic approach. And so I'm like, it's funny you say that because I feel like I try to li really restrain it. <laughs> that's so interesting. I feel like as long as the recipe itself has this approachable method, you know, with nothing extraneous, like you can be as romantic as you want, because it just adds to the experience of the, I mean, when you're too romantic, it's like, you know, no one can find the ingredient you're calling for, or, you know, whatever there, there's, I understand the ways to take it too far, but I don't think that these, it's so funny just to hear you say that. Cause like, that's what I love about the way that these recipes look and, and sound. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah. And you mentioned something earlier about your, I think you said it was your brother. Someone said like, oh, but you have great taste. So like, you know, whatever you do will be great. And I want to just touch on that because I also think you have great taste. And I think anyone that's been following you sees that. And just like looking at your background right now, which is a sort of oh. very artful, beautiful background. That's my with aunt who the book is dedicated to. Oh, really? Oh my God. Beautiful. Yeah, she she passed like, away last year. Uh, my dad that. painted that. That's a lovely tribute for your aunt to have that, the book for her. Um, yeah. And I think obviously there's like, you get a lot of this from, well, I should say, obviously I think, I guess I should ask, like, it feels like there's deep roots with this that comes from your childhood and growing up in this family that with this pastry shop and you said you lived across the street from it and your grandparents lived above it. And it was this, um, this sort of very formative childhood. And I'm just sort of wondering like, where, is that where your, I think you have a very distinct aesthetic. Is that where that comes from? How, how do you, how did, how did you develop that? Was it conscious? Was it organic? You know, I think, I mean, it's definitely been a process, even just visually, like when you see my photography from 10 years ago. Um, but I, it's funny because I think sometimes when I talk about it, my childhood, I think, am I just portraying something that I've been repeating over and over again, because I've been asked about this so much. Is it really mm -hmm. like, I don't want to overly romanticize it, but I realize it's like, really um, kind of a unique experience. So my, um, and I, I talk about kind of the backstory, but my grandfather, he worked in a factory making vacuum cleaners. But mm -hmm. when he, this is when he was married, but when he was a teenager, he was an apprentice, just sort of like how in France, you know, kids that don't want to go to school, they go to apprenticeship and pastry uh -huh. shops and they're like 14, 15. And so my grandfather did that and then went to war came back from war, worked at this vacuum cleaner factory, uh, but it, he was still baking on the side. And then finally they opened this pastry shop and they had, my grandparents had, this is my mom's parents. They had eight kids. And so it's wow. almost, my mom always says that the one reason why this bakery survived was because they have kind of, they had like slave, slave labor. <laughs> no, seriously, because every single one except, uh, well, this aunt who ended up working, but she also contributed, like she also helped out on well, my youngest aunt who ended up going into producing, but uh, everybody worked there. And so all the grandchildren, we were always in there. It was sort of like 
I describe it like a pine cone. We were so tight. And I think for me, sometimes it was like too much. It was like, so t- that's kind of how I had to leave. It was just like, so all consuming this, this shop and being across the street from it and growing, you know, my grandparents in, literally above it, there was a, an apartment, they lived there. And then I lived across the street from it. And so it's like really, in some ways it was like so beautiful, mm-hmm. but also like I needed to find something completely different because I, like I, as a child, I would, nobody would know who I was, but if like they would identify me, oh, she's from the pastry shop. Like, my identity was so tied to that place that I kind of needed to find something else. And so it's kind of, it's almost like I didn't really quite appreciate it as for what it was. I mean, I loved it and I just loved being with my grandparents and it felt really warm in so many ways, right? But then it took for me to leave it, to really mm-hmm. know how much it gave me. And so taking that legacy, I feel like, I'm making this legacy my my own, uh, but I want to always honor it. And so it's right. like, you know, it's like a tribute, tribute to them. And so anyhow, your question about taste. I mean, I think it's, I've always been interested in art. Um, I've never been, art was a thing that was kind of like not rewarded, not valued when I was, I, it was a very humble, like working class upbringing. And my dad painted on the side. So he was an engineer during the day. And then he would paint at night. So like th- that's kind of how it was seen. Like you had a day job. And then if you want any artistic pursuits, you just did it on the side, you know, in your own time. And so I was always exposed to that. Like my dad painting, painting. We always had music on. We always had, he would take us to the cinema. Like I remember when I was six years old, he would take us to watch like Peter Sellers movies or like, you know, something that was not appropriate for me, um, <laughs> but always exposing me to things and always making me want to travel. Like I'm, and just like there was a curiosity to my father that was like his artistic side and his curiosity. And then my grandparents had like my grandfather, the one that was a, a pastry chef, he, he had amazing taste. Like he loved, he was like such a delicate, like he loved buying jewelry, but like really like, I just remember like clo- he would buy like a sweater that was like, you know, like a really one sweater for the whole year, but it was like the most beautiful, just really amazing taste and just for the simplicity of things. And just, I think like I I had influences from all sides, but nobody ever took it seriously. So Mm. like when I decided to go into pastry school, they were like, what? Like you had (laughs) this all along, like what what are you doing? Now you move away and now you, and so I kind of had to find, all the pieces had to fall into place, but I had to find them on my own without you know, so, but I think it's just like the influence around me. Um, yeah. Yeah. But then also like, you know, why, I mean, just being observant of other photographers and artists and whatever's going on, like I've definitely influenced, you know, your work is so, like super influential. I was telling you, you know, like I loved how when Bon Appetit and clearly now on your own, like there was always something like, really like minimal but sophisticated like there was like a balance and so like that has been a big influence for me like see how other people do that um i mean so you know andrea gentle and mark you know so many friends that are just like influencing me sarah i think is here sarah copeland um so i mean i can like endless and like i said people who are like teaching me the technical aspect of gluten-free baking, photographers that inspire me, my family. It's just all, you know, ever grateful for everybody. Yeah. You. <laughs> well, I'll just say that it feels that to, to sort of receive your work and to, to read the recipes and to um, look at the images, it feels very, the sense is that it's very organic and very natural and not it doesn't feel labored or overwrought. And um, to me, it feels like a style that you, of course, no one really like invents anything in terms of yeah. an aesthetic, but it feels very you and I identify it. And um, and I think that's really special and unique actually. Um, so I just want, I like, I'm, I guess part of, I just like want you to know that, that that's- Thank you. I, I, I feel- like one's own work, you know? Yeah. And I do feel like I have landed there. Like I do feel like, 
um, when I see, for me, you know, like I'm, I'm happy when I land on a recipe that I've written or an image that I've taken that feels like me, even if it's not technically the best or, you know, that it feels like it really is a trend, like the essence of me and how I see the world. Um, and hopefully it, it resonates. And maybe I always find this, like I, what I've been really happy is that my previous book, Canela the Knee, has really, it came out two years ago, but it has really been just kind of like a steady thing that people have found. And if it hasn't felt rushed and it feels organic and it feels um, just kind of like a, everlasting I mean it won't be everlasting but you know what I mean you know what I mean it's like that's a really good feeling when it's um when people find it it's not shoved down I don't want to shove my work down people's throats I just want people to actually find it and they integrate it into their lives and it makes sense and they're so happy because they found it right right um I'm going to ask you one of my final questions before I move on to the Q&A um from the audience if anyone has questions please put them in the chat um but just sort of um, going back to your childhood, do you ha is there a certain bite of something or a certain flavor that is your Proustian Madeline, that thing that that transports you? Is does that does that exist for you? Yeah, so many. Oh my gosh! Like um, um, we have these brioche buns, and and I think it's only a thing of Bilbao. Like anywhere in Spain that I've been, I haven't really seen them. They're called bollos de mantequilla. So they're just like brioche buns and they have a little, sometimes they put like a little, um, like a crumble on top and they're sliced in half and they just are filled with buttercream. Like it's the simplest thing, but there's something about it that it's just like, it just takes me back. Cause it's the stuff I used to, like I used to eat that for breakfast with like <laughs> milk. Um, right. Or I mean, yeah, so I, I, there's so many little things it's hard to even, like lemon tarts and like now like quince paste, I'm gonna make, I got some quince, so I'm gonna make quince paste in the next few days. And so my grandfather used to make it and then he would make a little bit of like a thinner quince paste, almost like a jelly. And then he would put it inside the, like the butter cookies, like he'd make like sandwiches, mm -hmm. like so many things um, like that. Yeah. That just feel like are really like, they were really delicate and, and refined. Right. Quince Quince are, I'm so excited. They haven't come in New York yet, at least, I, well, I should look. But last time I checked, they hadn't come in yet. And I'm, it is truly my favorite fruit, farmer's market fruit. And I'm very excited for them. Um, and I just think that like hearing you talk, I mean, I understand the sort of self-questioning about like, am I romanticizing my childhood yeah. or, or portraying this, you know, in a, in a, in a particularly um, sort of perhaps skewed way. But, but I do think that you, to hear you speak of your childhood and to read about it in your book and in your writing is, it is so evocative. And I think that there was something I read on your website, which is that um, something to the effect of that, like you see yourself as a storyteller and that your work is sort of your, your, your medium and, and you, um, you, you, you use it to tell a story is that I really, I think that that comes through really clearly in all of your work. And so it's, it, I think it adds just an extra, sort of layer to to the recipes themselves and I, I it is just very um it feels very narrative in a lot of ways and then I sort of there's there's ways to sort of pull out these these moments of of great inspiration so um it's really it's well, really a pleasure to read ultimately my work um is therapy for me it's like really being able to have talked about just things in my life and and just kind of open up like that it's been like therapeutic so Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I told, I said this to you yesterday. I said, well, this is not exactly the same idea, but the, um, I tell people like, I don't do yoga, but I bake bread. You know, it, there is a very therapeutic, I think, aspect to baking and to bread making in particular. So I, I certainly understand that. Um, yeah. but I should get to a couple of questions from the audience. So, um, I have a few right here. So one is, this is from Erica. Erica asks, my starter has so much moisture. I'm weighing my ingredients, but I'm not sure how to address the extra moisture in the dough. Any tips? Okay. Um, most of the time in that, I answer that like every day. Most of the time when your dough is wet, it's likely because your flour and likely it's your brown rice flour. Um, it could be also the sorghum. 
is not finely milled. So I use super fine brown rice flour in all my recipes because it hydrates super well. But if you use a stone ground flour, I would recommend like Bob's Red Mill or Arrowhead Mills. I would recommend reducing the amount of water in the recipe by like 10% and see how that goes. But likely the most, um, the culprit of all of it is using psyllium husk powder that is not um, like baking grade because psyllium is actually a laxative. <laughs> So if you buy your psyllium husk, uh, first of all, don't buy flakes because that will be a total different, um, the way it absorbs moisture and water is gonna be totally different. Um, but if you are buying it in kind of like the digestion, like a whole foods and you go to like where you find your digest digestive kind of supplements, then likely that won't be strong enough. So I, there are two brands. I am not sponsored by anybody. I, I mention brands all the time, but. Anthony's Goods and Viva make really good baking grade um, psyllium husk powder. And I think that when you switch, when you use that, you will see a huge difference because it will, it will absorb all the moisture in the recipe much better and it will provide a lot more structure. And so when you're shaping your bread, it will kind of keep its shape. It'll be able to proof and kind of take more of a, expand a little bit more, not be so kind of flat and, and, um, and yes. And if you're referring only, sorry, I'm going on about this, but if you're referring only to your starter, I couldn't remember if it was like about the dough or about the starter. Uh, let's see. Uh, extra moisture in the dough. Is, seems to be in the dough. Sure. Okay. So yes, try uh, reducing the water 10% if you're not using super fine flour and then try using a psyllium that is really finely milled and like it's really good baking quality. Mm. Um, so this is sort of really, you mentioned a couple of brands. This question is sort of also about that. So Christy asks, do you include your favorite brands, parentheses, no fillers, et cetera, to use in the new book? If not, would you please share? Yeah, so that's, I mean, it's so important. And that's the problem with gluten-free baking is the inconsistency amongst brands. It's like, you know, and I don't know the brands like international, like in the UK, I don't know flower brands and things, but um, my favorite, again, not sponsored, my favorite brands uh, for gluten-free flowers are Bob's Red Mill, but I don't love their brown rice flour. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's a little too coarse. And so it doesn't really, it kind of has more of a, it doesn't hydrate well. Um, and it has a bit of a coarser mouthfeel. Um, but all their starters, their almond flour, uh, their oat flour, all those are great. Um, and then I love um, a small company in California called Authentic Foods. They're a very small mill and they actually are a mill and they mill their own rice. And it I think I want to say that all the rice they use comes from California, but I could be wrong. And it's like triple milled. It's like if you felt it next to wheat flour, it's very similar in that fineness. Because rice flour is very hard to get. Like you can't really mill rice flour at home. I mean, you can if you have like a, an actual mill, but like you can't just pulverize it in a food processor or something. Um, and then Anthony's Goods, it's a really great brand for lots of things. They're not, they're a packager. So they're not like a mill or anything like that, but they buy really high quality ingredients and they package them. So I love their, their stuff. Um, yeah, I feel like those are, and then Viva has really good, great uh, psyllium and flax, like I said, and those are the two binders that I use uh, in baking. And yeah, so yeah. Okay, all right, so Danielle asks, so she says, hello, Erin, baking recipes are hard to formulate from scratch because it's all science. Do you typically use another person's recipe as a starting point and then change things up based on what you're trying to achieve or do you start them all organically on your own? Thank you. I mean, I could be the only one. I don't think anybody starts from like out of the blue. I think we all have kind of, we start from different recipes that we've had. Like I still have, I used to work at the Ritz Carlton and I was a pastry chef there for three years and we had probably um, like 400 recipes. And I oftentimes, even though they're not gluten-free, but I reference them a lot. And like but the banana recipe that I have in my previous book was kind of an adaptation of that recipe, making it a little bit different. But like, I always start kind of like, I use a lot of recipes from that time from the Ritz Carlton because they come from like German and French pastry chefs. Mm -hmm. And then some from my family, but actually not that many from my family. 
Um, and then, you know, experiments that I've done with, then they kind of, it's like, I start, you know, going kind of like taking this, making that. Um, with bread, I, I kind of have a ratio now with like, you know, okay, I, I have, if I have this much flour and this much water, I need this much uh, salam and flax. So I kind of, I'm able to do something that I could probably draw out, like write out a bread recipe without having a reference. Mm -hmm. um, but of course, like that's because I have used other recipes before. Now I'm kind of making them my own. So I, I don't think anybody works in a vacuum. I always kind of say it's like, no doctor, doctors learn from other doctors. Like nobody has learned in a vacuum and we should honor that. Like, I feel like saying, oh, this is like you said, like my secret, my, 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 it's no, it's like, we're a product of like our environment, the people we've learned from. And, and, and I like already yet today when I was in the car, I was like, well, I want to make that kabocha cake. And <laughs> like, I was already kind of like looking at it and you already use coconut oil. So all these things that were already kind of like conducive for me to experiment with. And so it's like, I'm always inspired by so many things that are around me. So, so, you know, I am not like just a, uh, alchemist in a vacuum <laughs> right um there's a so here's a question which recipe in the book took you the longest to develop you know i mean the sourdough uh, that is it was in the previous one and now i am updating it for this one that took a long time and that's that was probably like a two year three year process of constantly tweaking mm -hmm. the one that i had different versions of was probably a chocolate chip cookie <laughs> yeah because I didn't, at first I didn't even want to have a chocolate chip cookie Cookie because I was like, there's so many out there. Like, what, am I going to offer anything new? And so I think I had eight versions. And then from each version, I probably tested like three, four times. So I, it's probably the ref, recipe that I made the most, mm. um, which is so, it sounds so silly, but. Um, no, it's always the one you think the challah is too, the challah too. The challah, I made a lot. And then I think Jackie, Omen uh, was one of my uh, recipe testers and she made it a ton too. So it's like her feedback and the, all the times I made it. Um, the challah is kind of based on the brioche. Like I, I have a brioche recipe that's really, well, that was another one that took me a long time. Uh, <laughs> so, but there's a couple of recipes that are based, they use the brioche dough as a base. And so like, I'm really excited. I'm really excited for people to make the challah because I've had that asked a lot, especially now with the holidays that just passed, you know, people were like, can I, can you share that with me now? It's like, I can't really <laughs> share it until the book comes out. Okay. It'll have to be next year, but. Okay. Well, they have it, they have it for this year, for this holiday. <laughs> well, um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Just a couple more. Um, so this, I know we're getting close on time, but Joanne asks, well, first says, thank you. Such an engaging and informative conversation. I'm curious to know if, if either of you have a favorite cookbook that always stays in the kitchen, whether or not you use it anymore. Ooh, that's a hard one because I hate to single out things that, and then I feel bad that I'm going to leave out. Right. Out <laughs> right. <people. laughs> right. Um, because if there's like, it, we'll assume that it's one of many, you know, if you just, anything that comes to yeah. mind. I have a couple that I'm like, they're sort of my, I just, I'm always what going is yours? You go first. Um, almost always, it just to me is like a, a great sort of never ending fount of inspiration is the Chez Panisse desserts book mm -hmm. because it's just, it's so like of its time, but yet so timeless. Um, and mm -hmm. is had, there's a lot of aspects of those recipes that I, um, they're, they're so simple. It's like, I aspire to them and they all feel very classic, but sort of modern at the same time. And so that, yeah. that's just always a reference point for me. Well, I was going to say for me, and this is a really old one. And when I look at it, it's kind of outdated in many ways, but it's a Michelle Bra one, you uh -huh. know, old French pastry, well, not, not pastry chef, but chef in general. And there was a desserts book. And I actually used to use that a lot when my yeah. sort of fine dining days at the Ritz Carlton, but and I don't necessarily like cook that way or bake that way anymore, but it, it, somehow it's always there. But when yeah. I'm looking for like inspiration, as far as like world, like for me, like in a book, I, I'm trying to create kind of a world. 
And I always go to Nigel Slater's tender because I love, you know, and ripe. So like vegetables and fruits is like, so that's kind of like when I want to go and have it a magical world, I go there. Yeah. And I, I love, yeah, like the old, the books that I had when I was in pastry school. But Japanese would be a good one because it's kind of like that too, like a very French, very simple. Yes. French. Um, yeah. I'm going to pull so, that out. It's so funny that you say that the Michelle Bra book, because I actually got that one probably within the last year or two, um, because Claudia Fleming said the same thing about it. It was like a, oh. a, a famous New York pastry chef. Um, someone I also have admired and has. Yes. And her book. Yeah. And I have her book. Like and her, bo- her book is another one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and she was like, and she said that that book was one that she goes back to often to look for inspiration. So it's so funny how they're, it really feels like they're all kind of in dialogue with each other. And, um, yeah. and it's, it's a great question because, and I, something I ask people too, is like, I'm curious where people go, what, what inspires them and what books they are always using as a reference. Um, so I use like- so many books though. It's like, it's ridiculous. If like, I look, everybody gives me something different and I, I love that. Right. Um, all right. I know it's 90. Well, I'm like in New York, it's 901. It's 601 there. I'm just going to ask one final question. Um, so Mons asks, where did you find the courage to go after this dream, this passion? I am literally ending my engineering degree and seriously considering changing my career path, but I'm so scared. Oof, I think that's a good starting point when you're scared. I think for me, and you, I mean, you're a great example um I think for me anytime I and I and not to sound brave because I am not brave I am a very fearful person um but as I have I'm almost 50 so as I'm taking accounting kind of my experience I'm like geez I've always kind of done all the things that I was afraid of doing and sort of like thinking like Sarah Silverman I I was telling Claire yesterday I love comedians so I was like and in this Sarah Silverman kick and she said one thing when she was depressed one day she was like I woke up and I was like nothing matters but then if that's the point then well there's you have nothing to lose so everything matters right so it's like really like taking the fear and like the doubt and just like well it all is gonna end anyway <laughs> you know it's just sort of like the fatalistic view of like you just gotta do it I think that's it and for me I have to I was very privileged because my husband, when I decided to go to culinary school, my husband was working. And so he could support us while I was going to school. And I did work, but I was making like $9 an hour. (laughs) So it's like impossible, unsustainable. So I was privileged and I want to acknowledge that not everybody's in that position, but anyway, so that was, I think you just have to like do it because it's it's all going to end anyway. Right. Um, well, I know I said that was the last question, but I want to, so that is like ending on like a rather philosophical note, but I think just to bring it back to something like very concrete as the final thought, um, and to sort of just reference back to the refer, uh, to the recipes. Um, I love that this book has a holiday baking chapter. Cause I really feel like it is a category unto itself and deserves to be recognized that way. Um, so if you could recommend one holiday recipe, since it's scarily like not that far away um mm-hmm. for people like what, yeah. what, would, what would, what's the what's the sort of um new favorite holiday recipe that was hard to that chapter was hard to there was a lot of elimination process because like oof, there's so many also so many cultural holiday traditions and I I didn't want to appropriate things that were not mine but I also wanted to offer that so I had to learn about things on my own um and so that was really interesting. The challah was definitely like, you know, I was kind of trying to, and then Jackie, who's probably listening, uh, she was kind of telling me about like the ritual of challah, the prayers, like what is a, an actual true, like when you're actually breaking the bread and what it can has to be oat flour, but I couldn't make it work with only oat flour. Anyhow, there was all these things. So I, I love, I think the challah I've worked really hard for um profiteroles which is what I make every Christmas Mm -hmm. I make uh my kids want profiteroles so I had also so many versions of the profiteroles um and I think they're they're really good um the pumpkin pie for example I love pumpkin pie and so I try to kind of like I mean 
honestly, I love the Libby's kind of recipe for pumpkin pie filling. Like the one that's yeah. in the can is like the simplest, the best. So I kind of took that ratio and just made it a little bit like using maple syrup, like sort of. And then I used more of a press in, uh, like a crumbly nut uh, base instead of pie dough. Um, so, so yeah, that, that's a good one. And there's a lot in the cookies and my family just walked in. <laughs> oh, okay. nice. Um, well, that's probably our cue actually yeah. that we've been chatting long enough, although there's like lots of other, of other things I wish I could have asked you, but we'll do it for another time. But I just want to say thank you and congratulations on the book for anyone that is wants to see the cover again. Here it is. Um, thank you so much, Claire. I feel like I can talk to you forever. <laughs> I know there's more, there's more things I want to pick your brain. About. I want to know, I mean, I, you know, I want to know like your process and yeah, but We'll, we'll save it with for your now. next book. Yeah. <laughs> right. Awesome. Hi, Ron. Hi, Claire. Hi. Hi. Hey, thanks so much. I had so much fun listening to you. And I feel like the, the chat is just blowing up right now. Um, lots of people saying thank you. What a special conversation. Um, they want to know more. <laughs> there were lots of questions in the in the QA. So apologies to anyone who we didn't get to, but um, thanks for joining us. Uh, again, um, Canelli Vanel Bakes Simple is available at booklarder.com. Uh, Ron is signing copies for us shortly, so um, we will have those. And again, the, the book will be available um, after the 26th of October, as that is the new publication date. Um, on behalf of Booklarder, Ron, Claire, thanks so much for joining us in the virtual space and taking time out of your evenings today to, to be with our guests. Um, we are so excited to continue um, hyping up your new book. <laughs> thank you, Claire and Magna. And thank you, everybody. I know it's, you know, it's late. And so I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, well, it was, a, it was a pleasure. So thanks everyone who, who listened. And, and thank you, Magna. Appreciate yes. it. Thank you. And there's someone asking, is a recording available? Yes, we will have a recording of this event posted on our YouTube channel within 48 hours. So keep a lookout um, for that link. It'll come to you in your Zoom post event note. Um, and on that note, have a good night, everyone. Thank we you. will see you later. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.